Hello, everyone, and welcome to Appian Portals, the front door to your applications. I'm John Rogers, a manager of product management with Appian. With me is Matt Richard, the CIO of Layuna, and we're excited to have you here today. I spotted a bunch of people out in the hallway still filtering in, so if you're still walking in, welcome. There are a couple more seats here, and um, by all means, filter in and find, find the best place you can uh, on the sides. <laughs> you already saw in the keynote presentation today, Alexis showed off the capabilities of portals, showed it in action. Today, we're gonna go a little deeper into why portals here, and uh, how your organization can best make use of portals, as well as getting specific on some of their technical capabilities, exactly what uh, the features are and how they work. Let's get started. In today's world, connection is key. You're not just building experiences to connect to your employees. You need to connect to your customers, your partners, your prospects, your contractors, maybe citizen populations or members of the general public. And in turn, all of those people expect to connect on their own terms. They expect a world-class experience that's exciting, engaging, fast, and meets their exact needs. And so it's no surprise that there's a huge variety of tools out there for building these public experiences, building public websites to connect with a variety of audiences. But that doesn't mean that all portals are created equal. Just because there's a lot of tools out there doesn't mean they'll all make a world-class portal. You don't want to be caught with a, a website that can't change as fast as the world changes, whether that's changing legislation or uh, worldwide events that really change what your users need. Um, you don't want your users to surge to your website only to find that it's slowing to a crawl or maybe even breaking. And worst of all, nobody wants to be uh, in that worst experience where you, you actually leak information it, that should have been secure. So if you're building a public website, if you're building a portal for your users, you really need these four things. You need not only to be able to have that website behave, uh, perform quickly, but also be able to build it quickly um, and, and be able to quickly build an experience that will actually connect to your users. But let's be honest, there's a lot of tools out there that can do that quickly, that can put up a website over a weekend that looks beautiful. Um, that's not the hard part to find when you're looking for what tool to build your public experiences with. The hard part comes in when you need that experience also to scale um, and to be secure. That's where a high code website builder will quickly increase how expensive it is to put out the next version, to maintain it, to change it, to keep it flexible as your needs change. And that's where you need the power of low code, where low code gives you the ability to make something quickly, to iterate on it rapidly, without compromising on the experience you can provide, how scalable that experience is, or how secure it is. And that's why we built Appian Portals. We wanted you to have the power of Appian's low code platform to build with the low code tools you already know how to use and be able to connect those low code experiences to your external users without them needing a user account, without them needing to log in just to experience your applications. And we wanted you to be able to do that quickly and with confidence. And so when we say portals is the front door to your applications, that's why. It's a way to take the low code tools that already build your most important workflows and seamlessly extend those UIs and experiences outside of the core logged in platform. What that does is it allows you to use Appian as a single tool for end-to-end -end digital transformation. No longer do you have to use a different tool for the public part of your experience. You've got one platform that can build all of the experiences you need. And that phrase, the front door to your applications, uh, isn't exactly new. You might have heard it last year, because last year at Appian World, Matt Calkins stood up and announced that our beta program for this. And that was when the world first heard of Appian Portals as the front door to your applications. Um, my experience of that was um, watching the emails start to rush in as soon as the keynote was over from folks who wanted to be involved in the beta program, which wanted to know more about what was happening. Um, and I'll never forget one of the very first emails I got was from Matt going, hey, I hope you've got room in the beta program because I have the perfect idea for portals. So, so Matt, what did, what did that look like from your side when you were listening to Matt's keynote and, and jumping in? 
Well, thanks, John. And you know, the funny thing is, is I don't think I even waited till the end of the keynote to just email John no, directly not. and say, "Listen, I got a way to do this. Let's let's get going with it." So, for us, if you want to uh, move to the next slide, uh, to understand our use case for portals, it helps to understand a little bit of who we are as an organization. So. Layuna is a labor union supporting construction workers, healthcare workers, sanitation workers across the United States and Canada. We have about 500,000 members. Um, and our job at the International is to advocate for them, to help with organizing initiatives, to help with contract negotiation, things like that. But for our user base, they don't, our members don't actually interact directly with Appian. Um, trying to onboard them into Appian would be its own set of difficulties <laughs> uh, coming up with 500,000 licenses would be its own sets of compl um, com complexities. So what we had coming up is every five years, our organization puts on a convention. Um, and as part of that convention, we elect all of our leaders for the next five years. So you can imagine my job is basically on the line with how well this goes or not. Um, so part of this was for the first time in our 120 year history, we were doing this virtually as everyone was having to deal with with COVID. Um, so we needed a way to get these 1,400 delegates registered, processed, and have all of their information validated um, quickly so that we could send them these almost $2,000 convention packages that had technology, equipment, um, materials that they needed to review to vote on our constitution and our leadership slate. So I emailed John. Two weeks later, we had a portal up and running. Um, Rob here is in the crowd somewhere. Uh, there he is. He also got a shout out from Matt Calkins earlier for building the health and safety portal that was, was demonstrated up there. We had that up and running. We had no calls, no issues. We were able to validate 1,400 delegates. No mistakes at all. All 1,400 packages went out, shipped, delivered. Con uh, convention was a success, and I still have my job. So. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you, John. So that was a little bit of your experience and, and also Rob's experience. Can you tell me, for those 1,400 delegates, what, what was their experience? Were they getting told, hey, now you need to go log into Appian? Well, the beauty of it was what we did is we just kind of set up a website redirect to our portal page. They went in, put in their member ID to validate who they were. It brought up all of their shipping and contact information. Two clicks, done. Yep. And most of them didn't have to update their information, right? But you can imagine, we have workers that work on pipeline projects, construction projects all over the country. So if that information isn't correct, those materials could end up at a PO box somewhere that they're using to just kind of have their checks delivered to while they're out in Montana working on a pipeline or something like that. So it was really important for us to make sure that this was successful. And the beauty of it was 1,400 very much non-tech savvy users <laughs> did not need to call us. And so that was another big win as another well. Another win, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about what Rob was doing during those two weeks and, and why this only took two weeks. Um, you already saw actually in the keynote, Alexis walked through this publishing form. And so I've, I've just got a screenshot of it here because you've already seen it in action. But part of the reason that this is so fast to do is that you're starting out with the same low code tools you build every other application with you're building a form that captures data. This is already something you do for almost every Appian application. Once you have that, this one page form is all it takes to take that UI and publish it publicly where anyone can access it, fill out the form and, and enter data. So you're putting in an interface rule, give the tab a name, pick out some branding information, and that quickly, you're done. What you're not doing, what we're doing behind the scenes is gathering up that interface rule, all of the other objects it uses, the integrations, the data types, the other rules, and packaging it and deploying it outside of the main Appian environment. This is automatically provisioned infrastructure. You don't have to worry about it. We're doing it automatically for you. And putting it in its own serverless web app outside the main platform is the way that we achieve this anonymous access. It's literally not being hosted within the Appian runtime that is authenticated. So that's fast and that's easy, and that explains how it's anonymous, but then how do you, if it is separate, how are you getting that information back into Appian? So on the, le on the left here, you've got your public interface. I just talked about how the, the publishing manager helps you quickly deploy that serverless standalone web application. Um, it's got your interface, it knows how to change screens as people interact with it and, and, and capture the data. It, is also, it also knows how to scale itself up and down. This is uh, an elastically scalable web app. 
Um, so if you have a surge of 1,000 people using it in a day, it can scale up to handle that usage. And if after that, everyone has registered for the convention and there's no one using it, it can scale right back down so that the hardware spend is, is really minimal. Um, now, I do want to emphasize there that what we are talking about scaling is that UI layer. Um, you can think of it as an elastically scalable UI for your application. As with every application, you're going to also need data and process. So how do you get that with your portal? And the answer is that you integrate back to the platform in most cases. You use an integration rule from your public interface. It calls a web API that you host on the main platform, and you use that connection to read data, write data, or start processes. And uh, as such, when you're thinking about the scalability of a portal, you have to consider both things. Uh, you have a, an elastically scalable UI, and whatever it is you integrate that UI with, you need to also consider its scalability to understand the total scalability of your solution. Um, you can integrate with the Appian platform. You can also integrate with third-party services of any kind. Anything that you can reach over HTTP, you can integrate with. And this is, that's all there is to it. It's a pretty simple architecture. Um, and that, like I said, you're gonna use, most portals will integrate directly back to the platform, and you can use that to read data, write data, start processes. That's the technical description of these capabilities, but what is it that you're actually going to do with that? And there's just a little bit of brainstorming on this slide, and, and I think to me, when I look at this, this breaks down into a couple of categories. We've already talked about capturing data. That was what Matt was doing with the delegate. There wasn't a process that needed to be started, they just needed to validate the data. You could use that same approach for an anonymous contractor survey. Um, you could use this, that same approach for uh, capturing public comments on a merger that is legally required to allow for public comments. Um, you can also be starting a process. This is good for maybe getting an insurance quote, applying for a grant, something where that first step is definitely starting by someone who's not in your organization, but the workflow that kicks off still might be complex, have dis business logic, have human approvals, have complex validations, all the things Appian Workflow is already great at, but that first step comes from outside the organization. You can also have read-only data. There are, in the public sector as well as other industries, there are plenty of situations where you're legally required to make a certain data set public. Portals makes it easy to make a read-only report and just publicly make it available for consumption to citizens or any other population who needs it. Um, so that's reading data, writing data, starting process. And then the fourth one I'll point out is self-registration. Um, someone who needs an Appian user account but doesn't have one yet, but by definition they can't log in to your Appian instance. Portal makes it really easy to provide them a request a user account form. And you can have that automatically provision an account. You could have that send a task to someone in your team to approve the account manually. You could integrate it with your user directory to make sure this is an email of someone in my organization, therefore I'm automatically gonna grant them a user account. Anything you need to for your needs to provision user accounts. That's what I see when I look at the slide, but I, I know, Matt, you said you're never st short on ideas. What, what do you see looking at this? Yeah, well, so when we were preparing for this presentation, talking through some of these ideas, immediately some things struck, uh, stuck out at me. But also, since then, three or four more ideas <laughs> have, have popped out at me. Yeah, so, um, we've already got a couple other portals live today. Um, through a partnership with one of our, our consulting groups, Groundswell, we have deployed a portal that allows contractors to come in and view benefit data about our membership. So not PII data, but rate data around what we pay our members for different benefits um, for different projects they work on. It's hugely important to us to get that one live because we were actually manually putting all this data in a 15-year-old system manually, and it's thousands and thousands of rates, right? The next thing we're looking at right now is health fairs, the thing that Matt Calkins mentioned this morning. Um, Rob's set up a process there where he was able to now allow contractors and local unions to kick off the request to have a health fair at their organization or at their job site. So this is things like checking um, your cholesterol all the way to getting a COVID vaccine, right? So these are the type of initiatives we're just, we're starting to run with today. Um, one of the big initiatives we're, we're thinking about now, because um, I've told everyone on my team at some point you're building a portal in the next few <laughs> weeks, so just get ready for it, right? Um, but one of the things we're thinking about is how do we enhance the safety of our membership? So 
one of the things people don't realize is that one of the leading killers of our members are ve vehicular homicides or ve people on construction sites, on roads getting hurt. But what if we can come up with a way that these members that today don't have access to interact with Appian can submit to us unsafe work conditions? And we can kick off processes to our health and safety group and our leadership at our local unions that say, hey, this is an unsafe work site. Get someone out here to speak to the foreman, right? So we're just ideas after ideas after ideas, right? It's, it's a really useful product as, as we see it to really finally get to that step where we can now engage and kick off Appian processes with these 500,000 members. Something we just didn't think was gonna be possible without standing up an external website and creating another form that would connect via an API or whatever way we would figure out how to do it. Now we can just live in Appian. Yeah, and in the case of your, your, your safety reporting, it's actually allowing you to kind of manifest your values to your entire organization. Awesome. I'm gonna go on from here to talk about some of the other aspects and capabilities of portals that we haven't touched on already. Just give you a few of the technical details there and uh, um, hopefully preemptively answer some of the questions you might have about how this works and what exactly it can do. So on this slide, we've already touched on that, that top option one, which is what we really expect most customer portals to do. For most of the needs and use cases we've encountered, the best option is going to be integrating back to the platform. Another capability that we have out in preview right now is designed for cases where you either have unusually high or unpredictable scale of usage or have a very, very strong need to make sure the portal's usage has no impact whatsoever on your internal applications. And that is the, the bottom option here, option two, which is that you can have a portal's connect directly to an external database. And what that does is now your user traffic on the portal only affects the portal, which as I've said, can scale elastically, and the database that it's reading and writing from. When that data needs to be available back in the Appian platform, the platform can pull that database on a schedule to pick up new information or changed information, and it gives you a, a more predictable and guaranteed throughput, even if there's a surge of user activity. The primary reason that this is in preview right now is that th with this capability, the databases that you can connect to are ones that have public IP addresses. Uh, we know for many of you, your databases are behind a VPN or have some other uh, access restrictions, and so if you have or can stand up a, a database that lives at a public IP address, this feature is ready for you to use. Um, for those of you who don't, know that we are working on those additional connectivity options, and when we have the ability to connect to a broader variety of databases, this capability is gonna come out of preview. Um, and like I said, it is the case now that even just looking at the needs of our customers, we think that 90 or 95% of them, option one is gonna be the best choice. This is a little bit of a summary of everything we've talked about so far, as well as pointing out, uh, I'll, I'll highlight a few other things on this slide. So at launch, portals are standalone, public, anonymous, web-only, Appian UIs. We've talked about most of those words, so I wanna zero in on web-only. What I mean by that is that our native mobile apps are authenticated applications, so your portals aren't going to be accessible through those. That doesn't mean at all that you won't be able to have portals on any device your users are using. It just means that on mobile devices, on tablets, your users will be accessing portals through the mobile browser. Um, you'll be able to still access our full range of responsive controls and make the experience great for those users. Um, they'll be, we, we call that web only because whether it's on desktop or a mobile device, they'll be in the browser and not in the native app. If you're interested in starting to work with portals, you'll need to be on the 22.1 release and on Appian Cloud. In terms of key capabilities, we've talked about a couple of these already, um, the uh, elastic scaling of the UI. Um, I did wanna point out, uh, just in case it wasn't apparent from some of the demos, that you can upload and download files. We create automatic connections for those to go directly to the Appian document repository. So you can use file upload and document download the same way that you would use for an authenticated application. In terms of security compliance, Appian portals are SOC 2 compliant. Um, you're not provisioning additional infrastructure to make a portal that gets automatically provisioned for you every time you make one. But since it is additional infrastructure, we need to get security certifications for that in the same way that the platform has. So at this time we have SOC 2, and we're working on the higher certifications like 
PCI, HIPAA, and FedRAMP. Finally, we've made the capability for portals to uh, use Google reCAPTCHA so that if you've got that publicly available experience and you're worried about that kind of greater surface area uh, and visibility of it, you can use reCAPTCHA to make sure that submissions you get through your portal are coming from a human. That's the summary of what we've got to tell you about today. I do want to call out a couple of additional things. If you haven't, if you just can't wait to get your hands on actually using a portal, uh, or if you've played Wordle or heard about Wordle or know someone who's played Wordle in the past couple months, which I think is everybody here, um, we decided that we would go ahead and build Wordle on Appian, on Appian portals. Um, so the URL at the bottom of the slide there uh, will allow you to play it. Uh, feel free to try that out and, and give that a whirl. If you want to understand a little bit more of the business impact of portals, I invite you to download our ebook today from the Appian website, The four, Top Four Traits of Powerful Portals. You can also uh, stop by the community hub. There's going to be a tech talk there on Wednesday at 12.25, uh, 12 sorry, on portals, and there's a standing booth there for Appian portals at all times. You can drop by and talk to one of our solutions consultants. Um, I'll be there for part of the day for uh, additional questions you have. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We'll take a few minutes of questions now. So I've got, I've got Luke coming up the center aisle with a microphone, so as I call on people, he'll run over and hand you the mic. I see on the center aisle here is the, the first question. Hi, can you hear me? I, uh, yes, if you can speak up a little bit, I can yeah. pretty much. Um, so you said that it's uh, for cloud only. Do you have any plans on doing on-prem? Because I could actually see a lot of clients that are huge, that are large, like 30, 40,000, they have internet portals, right? Mm -hmm. So I can see value where not everybody uh, in the company is going to be an Appian user, but they can probably take benefit from this. So having a portal that's used only within a company, but by the folks who don't have Appian accounts, by departments who don't yet have user licenses. Yeah. We hear about this a lot, actually. Um, it's one of the most common questions I get about portals. And right now, Appian portals are always publicly available. Um, now, that doesn't mean that everyone knows what the URL is. Uh, so what we tell people who have that question today is if you've got a portal whose best use is just for one of the departments in your organization, um, you're absolutely welcome to use Appian portals for that. Uh, be aware that anybody who knows the URL will be able to access it. Uh, and for many companies, what they want to do with portals is not particularly sensitive, and, and that's okay with them. Right now, we don't have immediate plans for uh, restricting access to portals in a way that would say, put them behind the company firewall so that it's only accessible to the organization. We think that for many of those use cases, it's gonna be a better fit to, for those people to folks to ultimately have Appian licenses. Okay. Um, I saw a hand up here as the second hand. Jason, in the front row. All right, uh, two questions. Uh, so can you, can you put a portal inside of an embedded interface? Can you embed a portal inside another UI? Not yet, but we're looking into it uh, a lot because it, this was one of the things we had been looking at before launch. It didn't quite make launch, but we know that in addition to maybe linking out to a portal from an existing website, in a lot of cases you'd love to embed it right there. Maybe you've got um, some, some form you want to be part of an existing website. Uh, Look for that in an upcoming release. I don't have a timeline for it yet, but it's one of the things that we are, we are looking at. Not yet, though. And I was also wondering if uh, you showed the, uh, the portal um, app that you built. Is there a way to view uh, the code behind that? Um, I reach out to me individually and we can talk. Um, <laughs> we're, not yet, we're not sharing that publicly right now. Um, I would have to go and clean it up a little bit, maybe comment it better if I was going to do that. <laughs> um, that was a spare time project for me, so I won't yet vouch for the, the cleanliness of the code. We could, it would just take a little investment to um, maybe comment, uh, comment the code a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Maybe clean with the New York Times. Probably. Yeah, we might have to talk to the New York, New York Times before we did that, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, here in the front row. Uh, so my question was primarily around the PII. There was a brief mention of PII data uh, by, I think, Matt. Um, when you collect self-service information or claim information and so forth, you obviously might end up kind of collecting some PII mm -hmm. data. So what, what safeguards from hacking and so forth? So that, that's where our security certifications come into play. If you're collecting PII, what, what protections does, a, does do portals give you? We are SOC 2 certified at, 
as of now, and working on higher certifications. So that has the same protections as the platform on entering data and knowing that it is not going to be able to be, say, intercepted in transit. Those kind of protections are the same as the platform. I think we have time for maybe one more question. I'm slightly over time, so I'll take this one here. Uh, sorry, right here in the second row. And then um, Matt and I can stick, stick around for a few more minutes if you want to come up to the front afterward. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question I have is, can we propose uh, Appian portals for our customers, you know, if they are looking to build a, a React kind of a portal, right? So can, is Appian portal is there yet? or we have to wait for maybe a few months. They want to build a React portal? Yeah, so, so in React.js? Yes, React.js. So can we recommend uh, Appian portals right now, or shall we wait for a few months till it gets? That's a great question. So would, if customers who want to have the, the control and flexibility of, of React.js for their front end, uh, portals is actually targeting a different value, which is the ability to use Appian sale for all of the UIs you create. Um, it actually replaces the existing capability to stand up a custom React you know, front end and just connect to Appian with Web APIs. That's what customers do to, did before portals. Um, so that is actually, I would say, targeting a different set of values than we have with Appian portals. Um, that's all the time for, I have for questions. Uh, Matt and I do have to head to the back to um, get our mics off and get ready for the next presentation. So if you want, have more questions, you can find us uh, by the camera at the back. Thank, Thank you again you. so much for your time. Leave us some feedback in the app. All right.